asked by the Bellevue Literary Review whether I believe writing can be healing or is that just a thing people say? Um, and it's a it's a really big question. <laughs> um, it's an intimidating question. But what the first thing that it reminds me of is this common piece of advice that a lot of nonfiction writers receive, uh, which is to write from the scar, not the wound. Meaning that if you're writing about something that is traumatic, something that hurt you, um, that it is sometimes best to wait until you've already healed before you write about the thing. Oftentimes, if you wait a little bit, um, you are able to access a, a new perspective and um, gain new insight that you wouldn't have in the heat of the moment. Oftentimes when I'm like, let's say, I don't know, I'm writing about um, a breakup. Right after the breakup, I'm in just so much like pain and agony and heartbreak that obviously everything I write is going to be really melodramatic. It's probably going to be very one-sided with me being the hero and the person who broke my heart being the villain. Um, but if I wait two, three, four months, um, oftentimes then yeah, I can access a, 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 a different perspective and gain new insight. Um, that said, you do lose a lot of things as well. Uh, some of my best uh, literature that I like to read is literature that feels very vivid and alive and melodramatic and <laughs> um, oftentimes writing in the heat of the moment is what can produce that kind of art. Um, and so yeah, there's something to be said about both sides. Um, in general, um, I do believe writing can be healing. But I also think that um, it isn't therapy. Um, I think therapy is therapy and writing can be therapeutic. Um, and in my own life, uh, writing about really traumatic things um, has um, really just given me the space to sit down with my feelings um, and reflect on whatever it is that happened. Um, I'm a very like avoidant person. Uh, when, you know, something traumatic happens to me, I usually just like shrug it off and, you know, keep it pushing. Uh, and I think that's the result of just like, you know, an onslaught of trauma that I think a lot of people can relate to, um, especially in the pandemic. You know, every other day we turn on the news and it's just some other horrible piece of thing that we just you know have to uh, swallow and move on and keep living our lives um and through writing through literally just sitting at my desk for you know four or five hours um a couple of days a week sometimes for months at a time and really processing how i feel about whatever it is that happened has helped me um but i can imagine there are um some people who um, are writing about certain subjects, for example, um, you know, a death or um, a sexual assault or something like that, where it can be very triggering um, to sit down with that memory for hours at a time without a professional's help. So it's a very complicated issue. Um, I will say, yes, it can be healing. And now I'm just going to read a short passage from my memoir, High Risk Homosexual. Um, this is from chapter three, titled Mama's Boy. And um, in this passage, I am 17 years old. I am in high school. And basically, I feel like a freak because I'm one of the few out queer people um, on campus and basically just desperate to get out of this homophobic environment, which is high school. I go to Gay Pride one weekend. So here it goes. It was Gay Pride weekend, so that Saturday, I rode the city bus to the parade with a flask of guava wine, the only alcohol we had at home, shoved into my underwear. It wasn't my first Pride, but it was my first one alone. I wondered if the other people seated around me on the bus had any idea where I was going in my little denim shorts and tank top. Once there, I followed the sound of upbeat music to a street overflowing with gay people, I found a spot among them and watched the trans elders marching with their fists in the air, the go-go boys hurling condoms from the tops of floats, the dykes on bikes pressing on the horns of their motorcycles, leaving in their wake a road littered with beads and confetti. I tried to match everyone's energy, but it felt awkward to smile and scream by myself 
Like I was crashing a party and they all knew. I wasn't even sure what I was supposed to be proud of. The closest thing was this. The year before, I came out to my mom. We'd been at the Clinique counter inside Saks Fifth Avenue, waiting to ask an employee about a coupon we'd gotten in the mail. There was no good reason for me to do it then, like there hadn't been one when I told my ex-boyfriend Angel. I suppose I just wanted to get it over with, and my gut told me she wouldn't make a scene around so many rich white ladies. I have to tell you something, I said, laying it out as gently as if I were dropping the words into hot oil. I think I like boys. I think I'm gay. Okay, mom said. And then she put on her sunglasses, I guess to cry. I was getting ready for her to grab my arm and pull me out of the store when a sales girl came up to us and offered her some free samples. Mom smiled and acted as if nothing had just happened. Maybe I should have thought it was strange how quickly the moment passed and a part of me did, but mostly I was focused on the fact that seconds later she'd moved on and was buying me a three month supply of face wash. That's it, I thought. It was such a nice idea that I let myself believe it. She really doesn't care. It wasn't until we made it back home and I heard her sobbing on the phone with an aunt that I understood how badly I'd hurt her. I expected my aunt would talk some sense into her and when she finished the call, she'd come into my room and kick me out or whoop me, but she didn't. She didn't do a thing. I was so grateful I got it in my head that I could repay her for her acceptance by proving that my being gay didn't mean I was going to change. If she waited a little, I'd show her I was practically still straight. Within a week, I hung up a Miami Dolphins football calendar in my room, threw out all my rom-coms, packed my flamboyant clothes into a suitcase, and hid it under my bed. In retrospect, this must have only confused her. It confused me. After all, what was the point of coming out if I was just going to recloset myself? Standing on the side of the street at Pride, surrounded by queers who seemed way more fearless than I could ever be, I felt like a poser. I ducked inside a porta potty and swallowed the flask of guava wine in one gulp, gagging at the toilet stench flooding my nostrils. The graffiti tagged walls were slimy with humidity, the space cramped and dark, but I was more comfortable in there than outside. It was easier to breathe with no one watching. When someone knocked on the door, I summoned the nerve to open it by promising myself I could leave in an hour. There was a strip of sidewalk nearby where businesses had set up booths selling rainbow sunglasses and giving free rapid HIV tests. I made my way over and tried looking available by standing near groups of strangers and laughing. Some of them, mainly older men wearing Western shirts tucked into Wranglers, played along. Pride is so corporate now, they said, and smile, what do you have to be sad about? When I was your age, whew. I accepted greedily. Their attention, the vodka cranberries and tequila sunrises they offered, they moved in closer, rubbed my chest through my clothes, squeezed my ass. Where do you live? They pulled me between their legs, slobbered on my neck. How old are you? With my mom, I answered, wiping their spit off my skin. Almost 18. <laughs>